My name is Jessica Cohen and today we're going to be creating some art together. This art lesson was inspired by the song I Love the Mountains that Jason Levy will be teaching you guys next. We are going to include all of the elements that are included in the song into our drawings and it's going to be a mountainscape. I was inspired by an artist in creating this lesson. Her name is Jen Arani and in Jen Arani's work you can, she loves to create mountainscapes and you can see that I created my mountainscapes with a couple of different color combinations. I used that uh, green blue scheme, yellow scheme here and the purple pink red scheme on this side. The difference here is that I used watercolor in these two and then I used colored pencil on these so you can choose what kinds of materials um, you would like to use for your sky. Our final picture is going to look something like this. Ready to get started? I am. Here we go. These are the materials that you're going to need. A pen or a pencil. Also a Sharpie marker or a thin line Sharpie marker is also um, something that will work for this. Something to trace with. And then you'll also need something to color with. Maybe some colored pencils or some crayons, whatever you have. And then we're ready to trace our bowl or our tracer. Whatever you have that's circular, make sure it's positioned really well on the paper. We're going to start with the daffodils. We're going to start by creating an oval shape. So you're going to create an oval, a wiggly oval though. So when you do this, make your line wiggle a little bit as you're creating your oval. Next step, you're going to create another line, a double line, inside that. So you're tracing that same line on the inner edge. On the front, you're going to make it a solid line. And then towards the back, you're going to make it a dashed line. With little dots, just like that. Next, we have to create a little curved line on the inside and some diagonal lines going up to create stamen and pistol in the middle of your flower. Little dots on the ends. Make two diagonal lines coming down from that wiggly oval. Make sure you do it with your eye first, or like I did it, I kind of drew it without drawing it at all. Like I'm tracing it in space and then I do it with a pen. So I do a pretend version and then I press down with a pen as soon as I'm sure about where those lines should go. Then I want a curve line at the bottom here. So remember I practiced making it first with my pen and then I make a curve line to finish it off at the bottom. I want to create the petals. Create two curve lines coming off of that main center of your daffodil. And then finish those lines off by making another curve line underneath. Curve it over, just like that. Now we have to fit in a couple more petals in between here, but you might not see the whole petal. So I'm going to start right from the base and make a curved line, but uh-oh, it doesn't go all the way. So I have to finish it off and then just let, let it touch the side. Then I'm going to pretend as though that petal goes right behind the other one and make a curved line. See how it looked like it was going to go right up to that center? And I can pretend where it would go, it's going behind, and then finish it off all the way to the side. Pretend, pretend, pretend by hovering my pen over that space and then finishing that line off so it looks like it's underneath. I also have to make two back petals because these guys have six petals. So you're going to go out, it's a pointy line, and up, stop before you go in between. I'm just drawing so you can see where they would go. You always pretend to kind of figure out where all your pieces belong. Next we have to turn the paper because we're going to create a, the same daffodil in this space. Turn your paper back. We're going to figure out where the stem goes. The stems of these go out and then down. So I kind of imagined it first and then I go out and then down and as soon as I know where it goes I make my vertical line standing straight and tall. I'm going to make it a double vertical line. 
I'm going to also create some curved leaves. Create a little daffodil bud. Two vertical parallel lines, a curved line, and another curved line. These usually have a little texture right before the bud. Curved line with a little line inside. And we're going to give that bud a couple little leaves. All right, we're done with our daffodil. Next part is going to be adding in our mountains. Now, think about all the mountains you've seen. They're usually kind of tall and spiky. We want our mountains to be kind of natural looking, but this first mountain is going behind our flower. So we're going to pretend like it's right there. Then we'll draw a diagonal, we'll skip over our flower that gets in the way, and then we'll draw our lines. Now sometimes I pretend that my hand is wiggly while I'm drawing these. Add another wiggly line right from one side to the next, a horizontal wiggly line that'll be a horizon line. Remember that things as they get further and further away look smaller and smaller, or they appear smaller. To each top of the mountain, I want you to add a zigzag line. If you add a zigzag line, that's going to be the shadow of our mountain. We're going to put those zigzags to the left of all of the mountain tops. Start right at the mountain top and create a zigzag. Don't make all your zigzags the same. We want them to look natural. We're going to create some diagonal lines to the left of the mountains. Make sure they're to the left, to the left your diagonal lines all the way to the left. And it's okay if these are a little bit rough. It's okay we want it to have a texture on our mountains. To add a little bit more texture, add some dots and some lines onto your mountains. To make them a little bit more rough. Here as though there's little crevices in those mountains. Think about what, what, those, what that texture might be like. Okay, we're going to add some of our rolling hills. We're gonna create some curved lines that curve right through. Curved lines, just like that. Curve your lines. You connect them by curving them. Remember, if the flower gets in the way, just skip over it, pretend, pretend to the other side some texture and then we're going to finish it off with another little line right underneath horizontal line. We already have a sense of space already. You can tell that things are going seeming as though they're going back in space. The flowers are closest to us, they're biggest, and the mountains are farthest away. Create a, we're going to create a really big wiggly line. See how I did that? And then underneath each one create a vertical line, standing straight and tall, and a curved line underneath each one. Create some horizontal lines to make it look like there's water to the side. Last part, we're going to put in our fire. And for the fire, we're going to create some teardrop-like shapes, spiky teardrop shapes, curved lines, two curved lines connecting. And for the wood on the bottom, a couple rectangular form shapes, and some circles on the bottom for our rocks. Last step, we're going to add some things to the sky, some little dots to our sky to make our stars, the night sky. And then we can add also a crisscross shape to make our stars a little bit bigger. The more variety of sizes, the more interesting it is for our viewers. And here is the final drawing with color. You can see that I added a bunch of um, purples and pinks to the sky. I was choosing between the blues and greens and the pinks and purples. You can see that you can make a decision for yourself if you're going to do a warm or a cool kind of sky. And you can color it in with whatever drawing materials you have. I used crayons for these ones. 
and colored pencils. And that's it. Good job, everyone. Thanks for joining me. So we're back again. We're about halfway through Escape from Mr. Lemoncello's Library. And we're on chapter 25 today. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Akimi grabbed the door handle to the young adult room. It's locked. Here, said Sierra, use my library card. Huh, said Akimi. Your books on the back are different too. I think they all are. I got the Egypt game and the Westing game. Two books about games, said Kyle. Sweet. Akimi slipped Sierra's card into a reader slot above the doorknob. The door clicked. Kyle pushed it open. The walls of the young adult room were painted purple and yellow. There were swirly zebra print rugs on the floor and a lumpy cluster of beanbag chairs. A couple of sofas were designed to look like scrabble trays with letter square pillows. Akimi nudged Kyle in the ribs. Check it out. In the far corner stood a carnival ticket booth with a mechanical dummy seated inside. A fun and games banner hung off the booth's striped roof. The dummy inside the glass booth? He looked like Mr. Lemoncello. He wasn't wearing a turban, but the Mr. Lemoncello mannequin reminded Kyle of the Zoltar Speaks fortune teller booths he'd seen in video game arcades. That's not really him, is it? said Akimi, who was right behind Kyle. No, it's a mechanical doll. The frozen automaton was dressed in a black top hat and a bright red ringmaster jacket. Since the booth had the fun and games banner, Kyle figured you might have to talk to the dummy to get a game. Um, hello, he said. We'd like to play a board game. Bells rang, whistles whistled, and chaser lights blinked. The mechanical Mr. Lemoncello jostled to life. If you want a game, just say its name. The life-size puppet's blocky jaw flapped, flapped open and shut, almost in sync with the words. Do you have Mr. Lemoncello's bewilderingly baffling bibliomania? Did Joey Pigza lose control? Was Ella enchanted? Huh? Just say yes, suggested Sierra. Yes, said Kyle. Well, great Gilly Hopkins, said the Lemoncello dummy. Here you go. Kyle heard some mechanical noises and some whirring. Then, with a clunk, a wide slot popped open in the front of the booth and a game box slid out. Enjoy, said the dummy, and remember, it's not whether you win or lose, it's how you play the game. So be sure to read the instructions, so you'll know how to play the game. Kyle took the box to a table. Okay, he said, raising the lid, let's set it up and... There was a beep and the door opened. Where is he? Andrew Peckelman barged into the room, waving his, mon his antique magazine, something called Popular Science Monthly. Who are you looking for, said Kyle. Mr. Lemoncello, I heard him. Is he in here? Kyle pointed toward the frozen Lemoncello doll sitting in the carny booth. It's a dummy. Peckelman whipped his head around from side to side. Is there a camera in here? Right over the door. Peckelman spun around to face it. Kyle, Akimi, and Sierra formed a human shield to hide their bibliomania box. I want to use a second lifeline, Peckelman shouted at the camera. I want to talk to an expert. Very well, said a calm voice Kyle immediately recognized as belonging to Dr. Zinchenko. With whom do you want to speak? The guy who wrote this stupid magazine article about cracking open bank vaults in the 1930s. I'm afraid we cannot arrange that for you, Andrew. Why not? The guy's a moron. He didn't tell me anything about how to open the front door, which is what my Google search said this magazine would do. We told you the way out isn't the way in. That was just a red herring, a trick to throw us off course. No, Andrew, it was not. What is the title of the article? Newest bank vaults defy the cracksman. Ah, well, that should have been the hint. Apparently, the reporter concluded that thieves could not break open the vault doors. When doing internet research, it is important to... Let me talk to that stupid idiot. I am sorry. The magazine was published in 1936. The reporter is dead. Well, then, I want to talk to Mr. Lemoncello. Excuse me? I want to talk to Mr. Lemoncello. This is highly irregular, and so is this game. You people have it rigged so Miguel Fernandez will win. I know you do. That's why Mr. Lemoncello is afraid to talk to me. Kyle heard the carnival booth dummy clatter back to life. Hello, Andrew. How may I help you? 
This limoncello didn't sound pre-recorded. Apparently, the real deal was using the dummy to do his talking. Your library stinks, shouted Peckleman. Oh dear, have you boys been playing that castle sewer game again? No, but this stupid article should have given me the stupid answer, but the stupid writer didn't write what he should have written. I see. And can you rephrase that in the form of a question? How many can I ask you? Just one, and then we're done. Okay, you're the expert on the stupid new library game. So where's your favorite contestant? Where's Miguel? Is that your final question? Yes. Assuming our video monitors are correct, Mr. Fernandez is on the other side of the third floor doing research in the art and artifacts room. Thanks. Andrew bolted out the door. The lemoncello puppet bucked and drooped its into its off mode. Kyle sprang up from the table. Come on, he said to Akimi and Sierra. Akimi sighed. Now where are we going? To make sure Peckleman doesn't do something stupid that gets Miguel kicked out of the game. And why would we do that? Because Miguel's our friend. Akimi glanced at her floor, floor plan. The art and artifacts room is on the other side of the circle. Sierra, stay here and guard the bo game box. Come on, Akimi. Kyle and Akimi looped around the third floor balcony to the other side. Kyle glanced at his watch. It was almost 3 p.m. They really needed to start focusing on the game and not all this other monkey junk. As they neared the art and artifacts room, there was a shout and the door flew open. Andrew Peckelman came running out. Behind him were a woman with the head and tail of a lioness and a pharaoh in a cobra headpiece. The pharaoh stopped. My onions grow in your earwax. And a series of holographic hieroglyphics danced across the air. Andrew Peckelman raced to a staircase, grabbed both handrails, and hurried down to the second floor. The Egyptians vanished. Kyle and Akimi entered the art and artifacts room and found Miguel seated at a desk with what looked like blueprints. You okay? asked Kyle. Yeah, man, I'm fine. Thanks. Those guys chasing Andrew, where'd they come from? Holograms from the giant Lego Sphinx and Pyramid exhibit. So why'd they turn on Andrew? I don't know. One minute he's yelling at me, the next the Pharaoh and Sekhmet are yelling at him. Sek who? said Kyle. Sekhmet, said Akimi, the Egyptian lion goddess and warrior. Haven't you read The Red Pyramid by Rick Reardon? It's on my list, said Kyle. Or it would be. He definitely needed to start reading this as soon as he could to catch up with everybody else. I bet the security guards in the control room fired up the Egyptians' holograms when they saw Andrew going berserk in here, said Akimi. Good, said Miguel. A library is supposed to be a place for, place for peaceful contemplation. That was when Sierra Russell rushed into the room. You guys, right after you let, the Mr. Lemoncello dummy spit out a bonus card. Chapter 26 Very clever, said Charles, pulling another silhouette card out of a book. This cover had been easy to find. It was the third book on the top shelf of the staff picks display. The image on the front was a bright yellow sign, yield sign. The title, Universal Road Signs by renowned trafficologist Abigail Rose Painter. Charles had found the matching book in the 300 rooms on the second floor. The 300s were all about social sciences, including things like commerce, communications, and ta-da, transportation. The image also fit nicely with the pictogram he had found in the 700 rooms in a book called The Umpire Strikes Back. That baseball book was the first cover on the second shelf in the display case and had given Charles a card with the classic pose of an umpire calling it out. Reading the images from left to right, then down, just like you'd read a book, Charles knew he was on the right track. The traffic sign book gave him walk and the umpire book gave him out. Put the two picture words together and he had walk out. Clearly, if he could find all 12 silhouettes, the staff picks display would tell him how to walk out of the library. Although he had absolutely no idea what the first image he had found, the quarterback tossing a pass, had to do with escaping the library. Not yet, anyway. Three down, nine to go, said Charles, winking up at the closest security camera. And, Mr. Lemoncello, if you're watching, may I just say that you are an extremely brilliant man. Charles had never sucked up to a video camera before. He figured it was worth a shot. Maybe Mr. Lemoncello would send him a bonus clue or something. Instead, when Charles stepped out of the 300 rooms, somebody sent him Andrew Peckelman. The goggle-eyed library geek was sputtering mad as he rushed down the steps and stomped around the second floor balcony. Stupid library, stupid Lemoncello, stupid Sphinx and Sekhmet. Why so glum, Andrew? Charles called out. Because this game stinks. 
Mr. Lemoncello just sent a bunch of holograms hurling hieroglyphics after me. He could put someone's eye out with those things. Really? With a hologram? Hey, they're made with lasers, aren't they? Indeed. Say, speaking of hieroglyphics, where might I find a book about picture languages? Ha! Why should I help you? Because Kyle Keeley is working with Akimi Hughes and Sierra Russell. I imagine it is only a matter of time before your friend Miguel Hernandez joins their team, too. Miguel isn't my friend. Besides, I'm better at navigating my way through a library than he'll ever be. I know. That's why I want you to on my team. Really? Charles smiled. Kids like Andrew Peckelman were so easy to manipulate. Oh, yes. Work with me and I guarantee you the world will know that you should be the head library aide at Alexandriaville Middle School. The 400s, blurted Peckelman. Pardon? That's where you'll find books on hieroglyphics and all kinds of languages. If you want secret codes, those are in the 600 rooms, the 650s to be exact. Charles shot out his hand. Welcome to Team Charles, Andrew. The new teammate stepped into the 400 room. For some reason, it was pitch dark and smelled like pine trees. Envenida, bienvenu, Witami, kuakaribisha. <laughs> Welcome, boomed a voice from the ceiling speakers. This is the 400 room, home of foreign languages. Here, Charles and Andrew, you can learn all about your American heritage. A bank of spotlights thumped on. Charles and Andrew were face to face, faced a blank face with a row of four featureless mannequins. An overhead projector beamed a movie onto dummy number two, turning it into a perky woman who looked like a flight attendant. Hello, and welcome to your American heritage. I'm Debbie. Let's begin your voyage. That's okay, said Charles. We're rather busy. Let's begin your voyage, the mannequin repeated. Charles sighed. Obviously, there was no way to turn this silly display off. He might as well speed things along by telling the dummy what it wanted to hear. Fine, but can we go with the abridged version? We're in a bit of a rush. Yeah, added Andrew. We have to escape before noon tomorrow. The woman, whose body remained frozen while a movie made her face and costume spring to life, reminded Charles of the graveyard statues from the Haunted Mansion ride at Disney World. While we research your family trees, she said, please enjoy this short and informative film. Is this part of the game? Andrew whispered to Charles. Possibly. Pay attention for any bonus clues. Okay, what do they look like? Who can ever say? A screen, a screen behind the life-size dummies leapt to life with all sorts of scratchy images of people huddled together on the deck of a boat near the Statue of Liberty. For decades, narrated the ceiling voice, public libraries have proudly served America's newest citizens, the immigrants who flock to these shores yearning for the freedom to build their own American dreams. Charles really wasn't interested in this kind of stuff. His ancestors were all Americans. The only language they spoke was English. Yes, the library is where many new arrivals journey first, to learn their homeland's new language. To keep in touch with the world they left behind, to search for the gainful employment that will make them productive residents of their newly adopted home. The movie dissolved into blackness. Thank you for your kind attention, chirped the cheerful Debbie. We have completed your American family tree. Let's meet your first American ancestors. Two mannequins sprang to illuminated life, both of them dressed in traditional Thanksgiving pilgrim costumes. I know who they are already, said Charles. That's John Chiltington and his wife, Eleanor. They came to Plymouth Colony on the Mayflower. Can we move on to Andrew's family, please? Of course, said Debbie. The mannequins quickly went through Andrew Pickleman's ancestry. Apparently, the family name had originally been Pickleman because they made pickles. After a prolonged parade of pickle people, the dummies took on the guise of Andrew's most famous ancestor, a guy in horn-rimmed glasses and a tweed sports coat named Peter Paul Pickleman. I appeared on the TV game show Concentration in 1968, he announced, and won a room full of furniture and wood pan paneling for my rumpus room. Charles smiled. He knew the TV game show Concentration was very similar to Mr. Lemoncello's phenomenal picture word puzzler, one of the games he had picked up at the toy store. Peter Paul Peckelman's claim to fame with further, was further confirmation that piecing together the picture puzzle would show Charles how to escape from the library. He'd been right. The dummies had just given him a bonus clue. Chapter 27 Exci Excited by the sudden appearance of a second bonus card, Sierra read it out loud. Two plus two can equal more than four. Put two and two together and you'll be closer than before. Akimi raised her hand. Yes, said Sierra. You do realize that Miguel here isn't on our team. Oh, right, sorry. Miguel turned to Kyle. You guys are a team? Yep, you want to join? 
Maybe. Not sure. Check back with me later, man. No problem, said Kyle. He fist-thumped his chest. Miguel fist-thumped his. They were flashing each other peace signs when Sierra said, I think this means we should all play together as a team. Remember when it says on the fountain down in the li lobby, knowledge not shared remains unknown. Maybe, said Miguel. Like I said, let me get back to you guys. I'm working on a few angles of my own. Flying solo. Sure, no problem. Kyle was about to do the whole fist bump peace sign thing again when he had a brainstorm. Miguel, quick question. What's on your library card? Miguel shrugged. My name and the number one. Nothing else, like on the back? Nothing, really. Couple of books. Two? Yeah. What are their titles? Miguel bit his lip. Don't want to say. Because you think they might be clues? Not saying what I might or might not be thinking, bro. Kyle nodded. There are two different books on the back of everybody's library cards, said Akimi thinking out loud. Putting two and two together and you'll be closer than before. The book titles are some sort of clue. My books are one, um, Akimi? Kyle shook his head, nodded toward Miguel. Right, sorry, my bad. Okay, Miguel, said Kyle. If and when you decide to team up with us, you can show us the two books on the back of your card, and we'll all show you ours. We'll also split the prize four ways. Deal? Deal. Come on, guys, Kyle gestured toward the exit. Where are we going, asked Sierra. Kyle dropped his voice. The Electronic Learning Center. You want to play video games, said Akimi? Now? Seriously, Kyle, we may need to rethink your status as team captain. I don't want to play video games. I want to check out the discard pile. Huh? The cards the players who went home early dumped into that goldfish bowl. I'm coming with you guys, said Miguel. I've been thinking about those extra cards, too. Fine, said Kyle. Whatever. When they entered the game room, they saw Clarence, his arms folded across his chest, genie style. He was standing guard in front of the discard pile. May I help you, he asked. Um, yeah, said Kyle. We want to check out the cards in the bowl. Sorry, said Clarence. You can't have them. But, said Mr. Lemoncello, his face suddenly appearing on every video screen in the room, you can win them! Dressed in a polka dot bows tie and snazzy jacket like a game show host, Mr. Lemoncello had one arm resting on a slender plexiglass, plexiglass podium. Behind him, Dr. Zinchenko, all decked out in a sparkly red mini dress, looked like the models that point at prizes on TV. Are the four of you ready to play Let's Do a Deal? When Mr. Lemoncello said that, he pushed a big red button in his podium. A pre-recorded studio audience whistled, cheered, and applauded. Um, what's Let's Do a Deal? asked Kyle. My first game to ever be turned into a TV show, brought to you by Lemon Pledge. Dr. Zinchenko started singing, Lemon Pledge, very pretty, put the shine down, lemon good. Thank you, Dr. Z, said Lemon, Mr. Lemoncello, bopping the button to make the audience cheer again. Now then, kids, here's the deal. Solve one simple picture puzzle and you four win the five library cards in the bowl. And if we lose... Simple. Each of you loses his or her library card and adds it to the discard bowl for our next lucky contestants to try and win. He banged the red button again. The audience cheered exactly the same way they cheered before. Kyle turned to the others. What do you say, guys? Let's go for it, said Akimi. Sierra nodded. Miguel? I'm in, bro. You're joining our team? Absolutely. They knocked knuckles to seal the deal. Mr. Lemoncello must have whacked his button again because the canned studio audience started cheering. Kyle wondered what the sound effects would be if he and his friends lost their library cards playing Let's Do a Deal. Probably groans and weeping. Lots and lots of weeping. Chapter 28 Now then, said Mr. Lemoncello, are you ready to play Risking Everything for Five Little Library Cards? Kyle swallowed hard, then he nodded. All right, you maniac McGee's. That's a book, guys. Here's your picture puzzle. The category is famous quotes. You have 60 seconds to solve this rebus. Wait a second, said Akimi. What's a rebus? You figure out the words in a phrase by looking at pictures and symbols, said Kyle. For instance, added Miguel, the letters R and E plus a picture of a school bus would equal rebus. Oh, okay, said Akimi, if you guys say so. Are you ready to play? Asked Mr. Lemoncello. Kyle looked at his teammates who nodded. Yes, sir. Then on your mark, get set, go dog go. Mr. Lemoncello's image disappeared. Tick-tock clock music started playing. The video screens all projected the same picture. I'll give you a second to look at them. We're officially dead, said Akimi. 55 seconds, said Mr. Lemoncello. 
Okay, we break it up four ways, said Kyle. The first and third rows are similar. I'll do them. I'll do the last one, said Akimi. I'll take the second row, said Miguel. I'm four, said Sierra. Fifty seconds, said Mr. Lemoncello. Everyone went to work. Minus some guy hitting himself in the thumb, but with a gur and an O, muttered Akimi. Then the male symbol where the L-E equals R-X. Marks? Does that make sense? Hello, Kyle, is my second half Marks? Kyle didn't answer. He was too busy deciphering his own clue line. Outlet changed the let to side, he mumbled. Golf minus the G and the L, the letter A. 40 seconds. Dog, he dropped to the third line. He just needed the first word. Bowling pins, without the P, but add an I. 30 seconds. Guile glanced at Miguel. He was moving his lips, mouthing out his part of the quote. Sierra, too. You guys ready, Kyle whispered? Hang on, said Miguel. 20 seconds. Okay, go. Kyle read the first line. Outside of a dog, and Miguel picked up his thread, a book is man best, man's best friend. Kyle continued, inside of a dog, Sierra took over, it's too dark to read. Akimi brought them home. Groucho Marks. Is that your final answer, asked Mr. Lemoncello? Yes, said Kyle, and then he repeated the entire quote. Outside of a dog, a book is man's best friend. Inside of a dog, it's too dark to read. Groucho Marks. Bells rang, chaser lights flashed, the audience went wild. Akimi and Sierra actually squealed and hugged each other. You're correct, shouted Mr. Lemontrell. There's no dead end in Norvelt, not today. Take those five library cards, Team Kyle. You won them fair and square. Charles and Andrew heard a commotion on the third floor. Bells ringing, an audience whooping it up. Girls squealing. Come on, said Charles. They raced up the stairs and into the electronic learning center. Kyle Keeley and his teammates were all hugging each other and slapping high fives. On every video screen in the game room, Charles could see a pictogram puzzle. What's going on in there, whispered Andrew. They might be gaining on us, Charles whispered back. We need to pick up our pace, quick. Where would I find a book called Hoosier Hospitality, written by Eve Healy Aresti? The 900s room, let's go. Charles and Andrew scurried back to the second floor and the 900s room, where they found Haley Daly holding Who's Your Hospitality by Eve Healy Aresti. Oh, hello, you guys, she said, slamming the book shut. Charles moved towards her, slowly. Find anything interesting in that book, Haley? Not really, she giggled. Just a bunch of dumb junk about Indiana. Charles knew she was hiding something. I wonder, Haley, if you and I might share a quiet word. He turned to Andrew. In private? Does that mean I'm supposed to leave? Yes, Andrew. It's for the good of the team. Trust me. Okay, but I'll be right outside that door if you decide to double-cross me or something. Thank you, Andrew. This will only take a quick minute. Smiling, Charles moved even closer to Haley, so close he could smell her gump bubble gum or shampoo. Maybe both. Let's step over here, he said, taking Haley by the elbow. I found another fascinating book that I think you'll just love. He guided her to a spot behind a bookcase where their conversation couldn't be observed by the security camera blinking up in the ceiling. Haley went with Charles. If he had been looking for the same book she'd just found, that meant he was playing the library escape game along a similar path. Charles Chiltington might have clues Haley could use. Clues she needed. Rumor has it, Charles whispered, that your parents wrote your et library essay for you. Inside, Haley was grinning. Obviously, Charles would try to bully her into joining his team. Fine, she'd pretend to be frightened. What, she whispered back, pretending to be terrified. That's a lie. My dad just helped me with some of the spelling. Aha, so you admit it. All the spelling in your essay wasn't your own? Okay, this was going to take some more acting skill than usual. Having someone check your spelling wasn't against anybody's rules for anything. She widened her eyes, made her lips quiver. What do you want, Charles? For you to join my team. Why should I do that? Two reasons. One, if you're on my side, your flagrant plagiarism remains our dirty little secret. Two, I know what to do with that silhouette card you just found in the Hoosier Hospitality book. You do? Oh yes, if we share our clues, the pictures will create a phrase telling us how to find the alternate exit. Haley smiled, for real. This was working out perfectly. She'd get all their clues, and even if they all won together, Mr. Lemoncello would definitely make her the real star of his TV commercials. She had zazz. Charles and Andrew did not. Okay, she said, deal. I'm on your team. Then she handed Charles the clue she found in the Hoosier book. Of course, said Charles. After all, Indiana is the Hoosier state. 
Chapter 29. Oh man, said Kyle, leading his team around the balcony back to the young adult room. Nine library cards, this is fantastic. They gathered around a table. Okay guys, time for everybody to put their cards on the table. Literally. The teammates set down their cards. Kyle spread out the five from the discard bowl. Akimi pulled out a pad and wrote all the information on one master list. Books and authors on the backs of library cards. Number one, Miguel Fernandez. Incident at Hawks Hill by Alan W. Eckert. No David by David Shannon. Number two, Akimi Hughes. One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish, Blue Fish by Dr. Seuss. Nine Stories by J.D. Salinger. Number three, Unknown. Number four, Bridget Wadge. Tales of Fourth Grade Nothing by Judy Bloom. Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone by J.K. Rowling. Number five, The Egypt Game by Zilpha Keatley Snyder. The Weston Game by Ellen Raskin. Number six, Yasmeen Smith Snyder. Around the World in 80 Days by Jules Verne. The Yak Who Yelled Yuck by Carol Pug Pugliano Martin. Number seven, Sean Keegan. Olivia by Ian Falconer. Unreal by Paul Jennings. Number eight, Unknown. Number nine, Rose Vermet. All of a Kind Family by Sidney Taylor. Seat or Scat by Carl Heisen. Number 10, Kayla Corson. Anna to the Infinite Power by Mildred Ames. Where the Sidewalk Ends by Shel Silverstein. Number 11, Unknown. Number 12, Kyle Keeley. I Love You, Stinky Face by Lisa McCourt. The Napping House by Audrey Wood. Wow, said Sierra, that is a lot of good books. But what do all those authors and titles mean? It means we need Charles, Andrews, and Haley's cards, said Kyle. Really, said Akimi, because if you ask me, we already have way too much information. Well, said Kyle, maybe later we'll find a clue that tells us how to read this clue. And how are we going to do that, asked Miguel. Have you ever played this, Kyle pointed to the bibliomania box. Nope, always wanted to. We were just about to get up a game. Does this have anything to do with finding our way out of the library? We sure hope so, said Akimi. Awesome. By the way, Kyle said to Miguel, what'd you find in the art and artifacts room? Yeah, said Akimi, all those papers you kept trying to hide from us. Miguel grinned. The original blueprints for the Gold Leaf Bank building. Clever, said Kyle. That way you could look for old exits that might still exist behind new walls. Exactly. Find any extra, ex extra exits, asked Akimi. Nope, no hidden windows either. Yeah, what's up with that? How come they built this place with so few windows? To discourage bank robbers, I guess, said Kyle. Yep, said Miguel. The only way in was through the front door. The fire exits could only be opened from the inside, like at a movie theater. The vault itself was all the way down in the basement. Mr. Lemoncello kept all that security, said Kyle, and added his own. So it would seem. Well, hopefully a bibliomania will lead us to some kind of alternate exit. And fast, said Akimi. Don't forget, we're not the only ones playing this game. One of those other guys is probably halfway out the door already. Okay, said Kyle. Gameplay is pretty simple. You spin the spinner and adventures piece the number of space the needle points to. You move around the library and go into each of the 10 Dewey Decimal Rooms, where you can pick up a book by answering a clue card. If you guess wrong, you get a new clue card in the same room on your next turn. The first person to fill the 10 slots in their bookshelf and spin their way out of the library wins. It's sort of like Trivial Pursuit, said Sierra, and the questions aren't all that hard because they're mostly multiple choice. Let's hear one, said Miguel eagerly. The cards were separated into 10 multicolored mini stacks, one for each room. Kyle grabbed a green card. Okay, this is for the 800s room, literature. Deathly ill and pursued by the ringwraiths, Frodo Baggins was carried safely across the River Brenan on the gleaming white elf horse of Glorfindel named A. Asphodel, B. Asphaloth, C. Almerian, D. Anglicale. Akimi shook her head like she was having a brain freeze. What? What? Huh? I think the answer might be A, said Miguel. They're all A's, said Kyle. Asphodel, Asphaloth, Al. It's B. Asphaloth, said Sierra. It's from J.A.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. Kyle flipped the card over and read the answer. You are correct. You get a copy of Lord of the Rings to put in your bookshelf. So Kyle, said Akimi, how exactly is knowing the name of an elf horse going to help us get out of the library? 
Maybe it's like a secret code, suggested Miguel. And the ten book titles will tell us form a sentence telling us how to get out. Possibly, said Kyle, but I see one problem. What's that? It's too random. Mr. Lemoncello would have no idea which ten cards we might pick. Well, said Sierra, maybe there are only ten questions, one for each room. Akimi grabbed the card stacks and fanned them out. Nope, they're all different. Hang on, said Kyle. He was remembering something about another game, Mr. Lemoncello's indoor-outdoor scavenger hunt. How his mother had been able to write to the company and request a set, fresh set of cards. Cards. He returned to the video camera mounted in a corner. I'd like my librarian consultation, please. What's up, Kyle? asked Miguel. I'm playing a hunch. The holographic Mrs. Tobin appeared behind the young adult librarian's desk. How may I help you, Kyle? My friends and I want to play Bibliomania, but we were wondering, is there a new set of cards? Yes, Kyle, there is. And a fresh deck of cards popped up through a slot in the desk. Chapter 30. We'll just play one bookshelf, said Kyle. Because we're on a team now, right, bro? Said Miguel. Right. Plus, we don't have all day. Well, said Akimi, technically we do. In fact, we have the rest of today and tomorrow till noon. We've got like 19 hours left, said Miguel. But Charles and the others, said Sierra, they could beat us. Right, said Kyle. After all, he is a Chiltington. And according to Sir Charles, they never lose. Miguel, you're the newest member of the team. You spin first. Miguel rubbed his hands together, limbered up his fingers, practiced flicking his index finger off his thumb, made sure he had a good snap and follow through. Would you hurry up and spin before my brain explodes, pleaded Akimi. No problem. Miguel flicked the plastic pointer. It whirled around the cardboard square, decorated with a sunburst of ten colorful triangles. Ooh, yeah. The triple zeros. General knowledge. Um, that's not so great, said Kyle. How come? You get to move zero spaces. Oh, bummer. Akimi shot up her hand. Yes, said Kyle. Do we really have to spin and count spaces and all that junk? We have a deadline. Clocks everywhere are ticking against us. Maybe we can just pull a pink card, suggested Sierra. It's really not how you play the game, said Kyle. Um, we're not really playing this game, Kyle, said Akimi. We're playing the other one, the big game, the one with the ginormous prize. I have to agree with Akimi, said Miguel. Fine, said Kyle. It's against the rules, but pull a pink card. You sure, bro? Just pull a pink. Miguel quickly sorted the new deck into ten stacks of different colors. He pulled the pink on the top of its pile. Hmm. These are different from the regular cards. He turned it over and showed it to the group. Zero plus 27 plus 0 .04 is... Easy peasy, said Akimi. The answer is 27.4 because the zero doesn't change the sum. Not in math, said Miguel, but this isn't math. This is the Dewey Decimal System, and there's always three numbers to the left of the decimal point. We need to find a book with the call number 027.4, said added Sierra. Fine, said Akimi, but I guarantee you it isn't a math book. <clears throat> the team made their way around the balcony circling the Dewey Decimal doors. Here we go, said Miguel. He slid his library card into a reader on a door labeled 000s. Okay, said Miguel. In here, we're going to find general knowledge, almanacs, encyclopedias, bibliographies, books about library science. It's a science, said Akimi. Where do they keep the chemicals? In the library, paced joked Sierra, who was loosening up. She hadn't read one page of a book in hours. Found it, said Miguel, reaching up to pull a book off a shelf. 027.4. Man, it's old. Look how yellow the pages are. So what's the antique's title, asked Akimi. Get to know your local library by Amy Alessio and Aaron Downey. Miguel held the book so everybody could see the cover. It was illustrated with a cartoony looking detective in a checkered hat who was holding up a magnifying glass to examine books on a shelf. Looks like a library guide for kids, said Miguel, opening up the cover to read one of the inside pages. First publication was way back in 1952. He flipped through a few pages. It explains the Dewey Decimal System. Contains a glossary of library terms, a brief history of libraries. He reached the back of the book. Awesome. What? asked Kyle as he and the others moved closer to see what Miguel had found. It's an old-fashioned book slip from the Alexandriaville Public Library. The one they tore down? 
Yep, and this card, tucked into a sleeve, glued to the back cover, comes from the olden days when they used to stamp the date. Stamp the date the book was due on a grid, and you had to fill in your name under Issued To. And look who checked this book out on 26th of May, 1964. Kyle and the others looked. Luigi Lemoncello. Down on the first floor, Charles used his library card to open the door to meeting room A. Who is to have access to this room? cooed a soothing voice from the ceiling. Me and my teammates, said Charles. Andrew Peckelman and Haley Daly. Thank you. Please have Andrew Peckelman and Haley Daly swipe their cards through the reader now. Both of them did. Thank you. Entrance to community room meeting room A will be limited to those approved by the host, Charles Chiltington. Have a good meeting. Charles and his team entered the sleek, ultra-modern, white-on-white conference room. There were 12 comfy chairs set up around a glass top table and a cabinet filled with top-of-the-line audiovisual equipment. You can write on the walls, said Andrew. They're like sm the smart boards at school. Excellent, said Charles, clasping his hands behind his back and pacing around the room. Now when we find all 12 pictograms and lay them out according to their position in the staff pick's display case, this will create a rebus for a phrase that, I am quite certain, will tell us exactly how to exit this library without triggering any alarms. Therefore, it is time for all of us to lay our cards on the table. Haley nodded and pulled two more silhouettes out of the back pocket of her jeans. I found one of these in a cookbook, she said. The other was in juvenile fiction. Nancy drew the mystery at Lilac Inn. There are blank note cards in this drawer, announced Andrew. We could use them as placeholders for the books we still need to find. They laid out a three by four grid of cards on the tabletop. Sheep, need, walking sign, guy throwing a baseball, need, 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 need. House, Indiana, guy throwing a football, need. What does it mean, said Andrew? Simple, said Charles. It means we need to find those other six books. Hello everyone, my name is Jason Levy and I'm the music teacher from Campus International School. Today we're going to be going to summer camp. I hope everybody's packed their bags and has enough room for s'mores later tonight around the campfire because we're going to be singing up a storm. So let's hit the road. So today we're going to be learning a song that I actually learned back when I was in summer camp. And this song has all of the things in nature that we love. So I'll sing it the first time so you can get a feel for what it sounds like. I love the mountains, I love the rolling hills, I love the flowers, I love the daffodils, I love the fireside when all the lights are low. Boom di ada, 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 boom di ada. So this first verse of the song lists a bunch of parts of nature that we really love and find very beautiful. So I'll sing a line and you echo after me. One, two, here I go. I love the mountains. I love the mountains. I love the rolling hills, I love the rolling hills, I love the flowers, I love the flowers, I love the daffodils, I love the daffodils, I love the fireside, I love the fireside, when all the lights are low, when all the lights are low, Boom di ada, 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 boom di ada. And that last boom di ada part, it's just nonsense syllables, but it repeats over and over and over again. So I'll sing the boom di ada part, all of it, and then you echo after me. Boom di ada, 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 boom di ada. Exactly. So that part's going to repeat in between each verse of the song, so you'll get really good at that really, really fast. So now let's go back to the beginning, and we'll take each of those bits of nature in little chunks. So we'll sing them two at a time. So I'll sing two of them, and then you'll echo after me. 
One, two, here I start. I love the mountains. I love the rolling hills. I love the mountains. I love the rolling hills. I love the flowers. I love the daffodils. I love the flowers. I love the daffodils. I love the fireside when all the lights are low. I love the fireside when all the lights are low. Boom di ada, 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 boom di ada. Very good. You are so good at these echoes. So now this time we're going to try the whole first verse together. We're going to sing it together. The words are going to be underneath me, so that'll help you out if you can, just in case you forget anything. So let's start together. One, two, here we go. I love the mountains. I love the rolling hills. I love the flowers. I love the daffodils. I love the fireside when all the lights are low. Boom di ada, 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 boom di ada. Excellent job. You guys are such great singers. So now that we've learned the first verse, we can move on to the next verse. Now the next verse also has some parts of nature that are so, so beautiful. So I'll sing it the first time and you can just listen and see how many of these parts of nature you recognize. I love the ocean. I love the open sea. I love the forest. I love the bumblebees. I love the stars above when night turns to day. Boom di ada, 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 boom di ada. So the second verse. I love the oceans. I love the open sea. I love the forest. I love the bumblebees. I love the stars above when night turns to day. So that's the second verse. So why don't you try that with me? And you'll notice that the notes are exactly the same as the first verse, it's just the words are different. And I'll have the words underneath me to help you out. One, two, here we go. I love the ocean. I love the open sea. I love the forest. I love the bumblebees. I love the stars above when night turns to day. Boom di ada, 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 boom di ada. You are such great singers. Excellent job on that. So now that we've learned the first and second verse, let's learn our last and final third verse. And this is also going to have some different parts of nature. So I'll sing it the first time, and you try to see how many you can remember. I love the sunshine. I love the butterflies. I love the wind blow. I love the river flow. I love the city lights when the moon is so high. Boom di ada, 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 boom di ada. Good. So how many of those do you remember? So it was I love the sunshine. I love the butterflies. Makes me think of the Douglas MacArthur uh, school, all my butterflies over there when I taught there. Um, I love the wind blow. I love the river flow. Yeah, the river flow is the fourth one. And then I love the city lights because we grew up in the city. Most of us uh, live here in the city. And then when the moon is so high. So try that whole verse with me. Um, and then I know you're going to be so strong on the boom di ada part. So let's sing it together, you and I. And the words will be underneath to help you out. One, two, here we go. I love the sunshine. I love the butterflies. I love the wind blow. I love the river flow. I love the city lights when the moon is so high. Boom di ada, 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 boom di ada. You are rock stars. This is sounding so fantastic. 
And after the three verses, we just go back to the first verse, which is the I love the mountains, I love the rolling hills part. So, so we're going to try the song one more time. We're going to go all the way from the beginning, do all the verses, and the words are going to be at the bottom of the screen to help you in case you've forgotten any of them. So here we go. Here we go. I love the mountains. I love the rolling hills. I love the flowers. I love the daffodils. I love the fireside when all the lights are low. Boom de yada, 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 boom de yada. I love the ocean. I love the open sea. I love the forest. I love the bumblebees. I love the stars above when night turns to day. Boom de yada, 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 boom de yada. I love the sunshine. I love the butterflies. I love the wind blow. I love the river flow. I love the city lights when the moon is so high. Boom de yada, 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 boom de yada. I love the mountains, I love the rolling hills, I love the flowers, I love the daffodils, I love the fireside when all the lights are low. Boom de yada, 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 boom. Excellent job, everybody. You are such great singers. And now you have a song to go along with the piece of art that you did with Miss Cohen earlier today. So it was so great singing songs with you today. Remember, I'm Mr. Levy from Campus International School, and I can't wait to make music with you again soon. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>